Well, the story of the cell cycle and the story of cancer have for hundreds of years been really two separate types of story. And, and I'd like to share with you how those two stories began and how those two stories have come together. In the case of the, the cell cycle, this really refers to a series of coordinated processes that ultimately lead to the division of a cell. Now, it's long been known that cells divide. And if we take the example of mythology, the story of Prometheus, the Greeks must have known that somehow the liver is able to proliferate and the cells of the liver are able to divide and ultimately regenerate. And one of the versions of the myth of Prometheus was that he was chained to a side of a mountain and his liver was pecked out uh, every day. And the following day, uh, his liver would, having regained its size, be pecked again. And this myth was really because he had stolen, apparently, fire from the gods. But the, nonetheless, the story depicts the understanding that cells in the mature organism are capable of dividing. So one of the, the questions that have long been uh, fundamental for humans is understanding how this regenerative process works. I'm sure that in uh, ancient times, well before the Greeks, it was known that cells divide in the mature organism because a wound uh, ultimately results in repair and the repair process involves the division of cells at the side of the wound which come together to heal. And in fact the, the idea of a, a healing wound and the notion of cancer finally have come together in recent studies because we know that within the gene expression of cancer we see the gene expression of a wound. So the story of the cell cycle has a of a great family and a great tradition of different models that have come together to the current understanding. In the 1800s, uh, there were technologies that allowed investigators to see that in fact cells divided. And the understanding of the processes that led to the cellular division were in many ways related to one fundamental question. Was the ability for cells to divide based on information within the cell or outside the cell. And perhaps this is a, the way in which humans approach many questions is our uh, future determined by something within us or within our stars. In, if one looks at the processes, in the 1960s there were experiments conducted in this case with slime and the experiments were to, there were four different uh, investigators looking at this, they looked at slime and the way in which slime underwent uncoordinated division and they found that the factors secreted by the slime when added to those cells co led to a coordinated cellular division after, after uh, incubation. And this led to the idea that there was a secreted factor which coordinated the, the cells to divide in a coordinated manner. And this factor was referred to as MPF, a maturation promoting factor. Now, in subsequent studies, um, the components that led to this process were identified within the cell. And this, in fact, consisted of a, a complex of proteins. And those proteins uh, were a regulatory subunit of an enzyme and a catalytic component of an enzyme. And so the identification of the cellular factors within the cell and outside the cell together led us to understand that there was a coordinated process which led to the, the division of a normal, normal cell. So the identification of MPF in the, in the mid-60s was very important and the identification of the intracellular kinase complex that led to this cellular division was important because of its structure. Knowing that there were kinases, enzymes that contained regulatory and catalytic components to promote cellular division led to uh, further studies to understand how the cell cycle worked in other uh, organ, organ, organisms, different species. So there were three very important types of investigations that took place.
subsequently using different organisms. The studies by Dr. Lee Hartwell, by Dr. Paul Nurse or Sir Paul Nurse and uh, Dr. Tim Hunt led to a, a better understanding of the molecular mechanisms coordinating the cell cycle using uh, different species and yeasts and complementation experiments in yeast and the identification in sea urchins of uh, cyclins. So together these investigators were received the Nobel Prize for their studies that led to a better understanding of the cell cycle. Now the transition to an understanding of the role of the cell cycle in cancer um, in part was led by a discovery by Dr Andrew Arnold where he cloned a breakpoint rearrangement in a type of tumour called parathyroid adenoma. And these are tumours that arise in the neck of humans. And he found that this particular gene, which he called PRAD1, resembled the, the structure of cyclins. And this then led to the understanding that this gene, subsequently called cyclin D1, was part of a complex that regulated a different phase of the cell cycle. So the cell cycle includes the cell division phase, or the mitotic phase, and this can be seen under the microscope. And then there were unseen phases of the cell cycle. The G1 phase, which occurs before cells synthesize their DNA, and then subsequently a second gap phase, or G2 phase, which precedes cellular mitosis. So during that G1 phase, that first gap, the gap where we couldn't see what was going on, the abundance of the cyclin D1 gene increased, the activity of its hollow enzyme kinase activity increased, and this in turn was important in transition with an irrevocable commitment of the cell to synthesize DNA and subsequently divide. Now the last uh, two decades have led to two key types of observations. One is that in human cancers there are mutations or deletions or changes in abundance of the proteins that regulate the cell cycle, and interfering with the abundance of these proteins could abrogate tumour growth. Uh, my laboratory demonstrated that a interference, a reduction in the abundance of the cyclin D1 gene blocked the growth of breast tumours in mice. And this observation was important in demonstrating that the cyclin D1 gene was rate limiting in the growth of tumours in the whole animal. Now if we think of cancer as a seed in a soil, if we inactivate the cyclin D1 gene in the breast cancer epithelial cell, it blocks the growth of the tumours. In subsequent studies by Peter Sachinsky, he demonstrated that inactivation of cyclin D1 in both the soil and the seed also blocked the growth of breast cancers in the whole animal. We went on to demonstrate using the mice that Peter had, had developed that if you just reduce the abundance of cyclin D1, you can abolish the growth of colon cancers in the whole animal. So this was important because a reduction in the abundance of cyclin D1 is possible through certain types of treatment through pharmacological intervention. So our studies demonstrating that a reduction rather than knocking out the cyclin D1 gene was sufficient to reduce colon tumour growth was important in providing evidence this was a tractable target for cancer treatment. Now there have been a number of recent clinical studies using drugs that block the activity of the cyclin D1 CDK complex, the enzyme that promotes DNA synthesis. And this is very promising because inactivation of the cyclin D CDK4 kinase could lead to uh, improved outcome in patients and recent studies in human breast cancer have illustrated the importance of this kinase activity using these kinase inhibitors. It's very important in our own thinking moving forward to take into account that inactivating kinases can have other types of effects. The inactivation of the kinase activity, for example, can also reduce the abundance of cyclin D1. So our laboratory has shown over the last uh, 15 years that there are other types of functions for cyclin D1 which may be important in promoting the tumour phenotype. In particular, the cyclin D1 gene, not only does it bind as part of an enzyme, it also binds to the promoter regulatory regions of genes and turns on the expression of genes. In the case of uh, an enzyme function, it phosphorylates the RB protein, a tumour suppressor, 
and it phosphorylates the NRF1 protein, which is very important in mitochondrial metabolism. My laboratory has shown that the cyclin D1 gene has several other functions. The cyclin D1 gene promotes angiogenesis, the production of new blood vessels. The cyclin D1 gene promotes migrational movements of cells. And as I will tell you shortly, the cyclin D1 gene and cellular migration is very important in metastasis, which ultimately kill patients. The cyclin D1 gene is capable of promoting cellular metabolism and promoting, in the case of uh, normal cells and in the case of cancerous cells, the coordination of mitochondrial energetics and nuclear DNA synthesis. We've also shown that the cyclin D1 gene coordinates not just normal gene expression, the coding genome, but also coordinates the non-coding RNA, the microRNA, and the biogenesis of the non-coding RNA. So these diverse functions of cyclin D1 may be very important in the final phenotype of promoting tumor genesis. Understanding these distinct functions of cyclin D1 is very important as we move forward designing very specific targeted therapies to improve the outcome and ultimately the survival of patients affected with cancer. So what I've talked about today is a story that's evolved over hundreds of years um, with improved types of technologies, we've been able to obtain appropriate empirical data that led to a current model of understanding of how the cell coordinates information that allows the cell to ultimately divide. I've described the fact that the apparatus that coordinates the cell cycle is perturbed in a variety of different human cancers. This has led to our understanding that the process of cancer may be interrupted by fixing those changes that occur in the cell cycle associated with that particular tumour. Recent studies have demonstrated that regulating that kinase activity, in particular cyclin D1 kinase activity in human cancers, can improve outcome of patients affected with cancer, in particular human breast cancer. The future, I believe, is very bright as we continue to provide more empirical insights and understanding how the cell cycle changes in cancer, being able to design therapies that target the specific abnormalities that occur in a particular patient's tumour will be important in providing more precise therapy for patients' cancer and provide a higher quality of life for patients with cancer using these specific targeted treatments.